So in 1984, I elected to help negotiate. I'm not going to go into all of it, but General Motors had requested that we come in two weeks early so that they could tell us as to how the need for to be competitive with the Japanese. And I will say that for two weeks, they've done an excellent job. No, they really job. At that particular point in time, the Japanese yen was very, you know, very low in relationship to the dollar. And so General Motors, uh, uh, the Japanese were making a lot of money on the small farms. Anyhow, the city in that, if you remember, people standing in line for gas in 1973 with the oil embargo, mm -hmm. okay? And people were lined up at gas stations to get there. There was an energy crisis. We were to turn off our lights. Buildings shut their lights down. No longer did you see them. All kinds of energy crisis. What is it, 30 odd years later, after doing what we've done, we're still got an energy crisis. Let me go back to the 1984 negotiations. For two weeks, we, we were told where they, where they were competitive. The end of this two weeks, the biggest job was job security. <clears throat> what came out of the job security? Jobs banks. That was the brilliant idea. So anyhow, at the end of the contract, they go around the table on the fifth floor, and you've got a button underneath when you want to talk. And they said, okay, all those in favor of this contract signify. And they went around, yes, 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 no. At that particular point in time, Al Warren, who was then the head of labor relations for John Moore, said, well, Peter, uh, what's your problem? I said, well, you know, Mr. Warren, you brought me in here two weeks early. And you told me what was the high, what was required to be competitive for the Japanese. And I want to ask you a question. He said, well, what's that? I said, how many people do you think are in jobs banks in Japan? Hmm. It was just about seven since this year. <laughs> I said, if you hire one more person, you've told, you've told me the need to be competitive. If you hire one more person, you know, to make, uh, the, to make the cars that you can sell, you're feather bedding. At that point, Don Ethan, who was then director of General Motors, looked down at the table at me and said, what's the matter with you? Are you against job security? I said, this is not job security. This is like being on the Titanic. We're going to go up one more deck. <laughs> Eventually, this boat's going down. Wow. Every afternoon after we got out of negotiations, I would go to the Normandy bar. I have a cocktail before I went home for dinner. And Normandy Bar was pretty well packed with the General Motors people and the UAW people. As I told people, there were three seats on each side of me, naked. Nobody would come there. <laughs> I was absolutely, I had a nice quiet cocktail by myself. <laughs> at the end of negotiation, <coughs> and at the end of that contract, they said that contract, I was sitting there and a General Motors guy came up to me and he says, can I buy you a drink? I said, sure. <laughs> and he said, you know, Kelly, the tragic thing is, is about there's nobody up there listening to you, not even your side or our side. That guy left General Motors and became a professor at the University of Michigan. But interesting enough, this job saving thing, jobs banks, this is what Delphi, not too long ago, two years I read it in the paper in, in Daytona Beach, that Delphi wants rid of the jobs banks. You know, when we talk about concessions, okay, that have been given, all we have done is enable these corporations to continue their arrogance, their stupidity, their lack of foresight in relationship to their competition. They are absolutely bereft of anything. General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler today, it is inevitable, it was inevitable for them not to get to this point in time because of the lack of foresight. <clears throat> they, could, they thought in 1970 when the small car came in and the gas uh, embargo was on, they thought, well, we'll make small cars. 
Their idea of making a small car was to cut 10 inches off the front and 10 <laughs> inches off the back, and that's a small car. That's not. <laughs> All small cars have to be engineered from the ground up. So they had their mistakes. They had the Pinto, and what? A, and they had the uh, Chevette, and what the hell they had. All went to the wall. They were useless. So what did they do? They said, "What the hell with it? Small cars. There's not the profit in small cars as there is in the luxury." So we're going to abandon the small car market to the Japanese. And I asked them, Greg, what the hell makes you think that the Japanese are going to be satisfied with the lower end of this market? Don't you understand they're coming into the mid-size and the luxury? Lack of foresight. Stupidity. And all we have done with the concessions is to enable them to continue that. If you can recall Chrysler, were going belly up, and they were bailed out. And who had to make the concessions? The concessions were the banks were going to come in and the government was going to come in, but the workers in Chrysler had to make concessions. <laughs> Several years after that, when Chrysler was doing very well, the government got their money back, and the banks got their money back. Who do you think was the last to get their concessions? Their concessions back? The workers. Of course. This is what happens when you talk about it. We have been, in the UAW, you can say, started to make concessions after concessions. I don't think it takes any genius to go in and give away benefits that you've had. I don't think that takes a genius at all. No. I mean, at one particular point in time, this union was about 1.4 million or something. Like that. Right. I think it's less than 1.5. At this time, at point in time, what is it, five, six hundred thousand? No, they were not. What? No, they were not. At least below six hundred. Okay. It's amazing, you know. Mm -hmm. But when you talk about the trade union movement, just not pick on the UAW as being what they have done, delinquent, because if they led the way up in progress, in relationship to getting cost of livings and other unions followed, they've also led the way down by giving concessions. Let me just say that. I was in um, I was in a uh, conference in Myrtle Beach on pensions, and the teamsters were there, and there was a head of the the top negotiator, the top uh, lawyer for the the teamsters was in that conference, and he was talking to the, us, the scout delegates, telling us about how the government, how the government was coming down on teamsters with the RICO Act. Okay. It was amazing. I remember that very well. I got up and asked, excuse me, but uh, didn't your um, president, uh, Fitzsimmons, didn't he endorse Nixon? Hmm. Didn't he come out for Richard Nixon, hmm. who gave you the legal hand? Hmm. What the hell is the matter with you? What do you expect? He went through his nut. He just done his nut. You know, the biggest thing that happened in this union that should stop was the firing of the air controller strike by Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. At that particular point in time, they had been a goddamn labor leader in this country with enough balls. It should have been a national strike and stop it right there. Here, here. Yep. Mm -hmm. It should have been stopped. But that's the problem with your labor leaders. How did they get there? By ass kissing their way all the way up. And I can understand a guy in a productive mind, if he's a militant, to be boiled off very suddenly. Who the hell wants to work in a production line for 2030? He's going to be bought off in the international staff, okay? Thousands of people have been sucked up into the staff that way. Difficult. Difficult to get people to stay the course. To stay with it, to the very, to keep fighting. The question about like, the American labor movement, where did we make a mistake? In the estimation, the biggest mistake that we made was uh, not an organizing. 